Hello, students. Um, we are talking about Chapter 16, and these are priorities for the intraoperative phase. Remember, we talked about the um, phases, um, preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative. So this chapter is discuss the experience during surgery and the importance of um, the nurse, you know, being well informed of what is happening before and what is going to happen during this um, patient's experience. Next slide. All right, so um, the surgical experience um, overview is this next slide. Um, so there are set settings that uh, the patient would, you know, get um, their surgery completed. So um, that includes inpatient surgical setting or ambulatory or outpatient. So for something that is minor, um, the patient will go into an outpatient setting and then the expectation is that they go back home. Um, in um, inpatient, you know, hospitalized surgery, um, you know, requires a little bit more and generally um, it makes sense to have the client um, stay in the hospital. So inpatient setting um, perform the surgical uh, procedures that require admissions um, to a hospital unit post-operatively. So after surgery, they need to be admitted. Um, inpatient procedure often very extensive and they're usually very long versus the um, ambulatory outpatient, which is performed without admittance into the hospital before or after the procedure. So, um, you know, the surgery center may be freestanding or located in the hospital, but you go in and go out. Um, and these are referred to as same day um, surgery, same day surgery, uh, patient surgery. It's usually less um, invasive, again, shorter in operating time and it requires less than 24 hours of monitor. Um, recovery time. Um, there are different type of surgeries, um, so um, elective, urgent, or emergency. Um, elective surgery is surgery that the patient chooses to have, right? I want to have a breast augmentation, right? I want to do that. Versus urgent surgery, although they are necessary, but they may be scheduled rather than done immediately. And that's the difference with an emergency surgery. It's on schedule and it's done immediately to save the patient's limb or life. All right, next slide. Um, and then you have the surgical, the sterile team, right? The surgical team, very important. So you have the surgeon and his surgical assistants and then the scrub nurses, surgical technologist or OR technician, right? So the team, again, as um, the surgeon usually, and then you have an anesthesia provider, um, and then you have the perioperative, you know, RN, and perhaps other, you know, unlicensed assistant personnel, um, such as a surgical tech, right? So as a nurse, you can delegate, and these are some of the individuals that you're going to delegate to. Um, so the team members um, have key function in a surgical procedure, um, and usually they are categorized as sterile, you know, individuals who perform the surgical scrub and don on the gloves and the gowns. And then you have the ones who are non-sterile. So these are the ones who perform the function outside of the identified um, sterile field um, and according to their roles and responsibility in preparing for an operation. And the sterile team members, you know, those are the ones who work within the sterile field, right? And have the responsibility of maintaining a sepsis because it's critical, right? This is a surgical experience, so it has to be aseptic throughout the surgical procedure. Um, the field usually includes the OR tables, right? And the areas closely surrounding it, any equipment that they can use um, called the Mayo stand that is um, positioned close to the client and the instrument um, table. All right, next slide. So the, um, the non-sterile members, you know, um, you know, those are the anesthesia provider. Um, they can be anesthesiologists or certified registered nurse anesthetist. So that's an advanced practice nurse um, or a physician. You know, in the initial period of the operative stage, the anesthesia, the anesthetic agent are administered, right? Post-operative phase begins when the patient is removed from the operating suite to the post-anesthesia um, care unit, the PACU, right? There, that's where the anesthesia provider continues to maintain responsibility for the patient's physiological status, right? Because, you know, 
Yeah, the medication was administered. It's probably still going to be administered at a different level. And then you have um, the circulating nurse. These are, again, non-steroid team members. Um, the RN, the circulating nurse, they, her job is to observe the surgical procedure from a broad perspective, assisting the team in creating and maintaining a safe and comfortable environment for the surgical patient. And then you have the unlicensed assisted personnel, okay? They are accountable to work and under the supervision of the perioperative RN. So RNs are really, really important. Their duties include patient transport to the OR and helping with the positioning and securing of the patient on the OR table in preparation for the procedure. So you need people to help, so delegation, right? And then you have the OR director, the coordinator, and the manager. They are responsible for overseeing the business aspect of the OR. All right, next slide. So um, in the preoperative assessment, um, we have taken the patient's knowledge of surgery, complications, and other intervention. We validated and confirmed the informed consent was obtained, the patient's level of anxiety. We managed all of that, the fear about the postoperative you know, um, concerns, and then you have a pause. This is verifying important information prior to the procedure, prior to the procedure. All right, so again, the pause, the timeout is done, again, to make sure that we have the right patient, we have the correct procedure, we have the correct surgeon, we have the correct position, we have the correct um, lateral, um, um, the correct um, lateral position, we have the correct equipment, we have the correct imaging, we have the placement of the implants, and we have determined. So this pause state and timeout is to make sure it's not possible that we made another mistake here. All right, next slide. All right, so now you have um, here is the scrub, the surgical scrub. So again, right, we'll make sure that this is right. Then we're going to scrub the area, right? We want to make sure that the area is free of infection, right? Prevent surgical site infection, you know, and then it's followed by hygiene and scrub, a hand scrub procedure, right? Um, so you know, it's really important that, you know, everybody who is part of the process, that surgical team, they scrub, and they scrub for a specific number of time, right? So the warm, moist condition inside the surgical glove are also an, an ideal environment for rapid growth of the environment. So we want to make sure that those gloves, you know, do not, you know, create any risk. You know, there are some risks or risk for infection, post-operative infection, but we need to make sure that they are not um, torn at all. Next slide. So anyway, so the apparel, so it's an apparel that's being worn, right? So the scrubs, you know, um, say a one, you know, in the sterile environment. So they have shirts, pants, dresses, are worn by surgeon, nurses, and other souls covering the face. And you probably just see the eyes um, because the eyes need to see what they're doing, right? Next slide. And then anesthesia, right? Anesthesia is important, especially um, surgery, and they're going to cut, and the patient's going to be pain. Without anesthesia, most surgical procedure performed today would not be possible. So um, anesthesia is derived from an Asian Greek word anesthesis, right, which means lack of or no sensation. Um, the goal, again, is to, to make sure that there's use of balanced anesthesia, uh, which consists of one or more, um, one to several agents, right, that is used. So the goal is, you know, amnesia, anesthetic, depression of the, um, the reflexes, the muscle relaxing, and manipulation of physiological um, symptoms. So all the things that it does, you got to look to make sure that things are, are returning after the, anest um, the anesthetic ones up. Next slide. So there's different types of anesthesia that could be used. You know, the Vosotol type um, are used, um, you know, and then you have um, the muscle relaxing type, you know, as the depolarize agent. Um, so, but the issue is with anesthesia, you got to worry about the complications that go with it, right? So it could be some of the complications would be hypoxia, respiratory or cardiovascular dysfunction, hypotension, hypertension, you know, fluid and electrolyte imbalances, residual muscle paralysis, you know, neurological problems such as dementia, prolonged awakening, paresthesia, 
or malignant hyperthermia. All really, really significant, right? And that's for general anesthesia. So for regional anesthesia is where a local anesthetic agent is used to block or anesthetize a nerve or nerve fiber. Um, and there's different ways to do so. So spinal medication, where we inject into the spinal canal, you know, um, surrounding tissue, typically in the lower back or lumbar. And then you have the epidural, um, which is injection into the epidural space, into the lumbar region or thoracic region. And then the cardiac is a form of um, epidural anesthesia where the medication is inject injected into the epidural space through the, the cardiac canal in the sacrum. And then the nerve block, you know, and um, is to um, to nerve a particular uh, to 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 block a particular nerve. All right. Next slide. And then you have local anesthetics that can also be used, um, and these are reversible. You know, um, and there's different types. There's um, lidocaine. There's esters such as cocaine. Um, so the key here is to monitor um, the anesthetic care. So monitor objectives for the patient receiving conscious sedation, right? So we're giving them conscious sedation. So monitor anesthetic care. So they're giving conscious sedation. And so the nurse has to monitor um, for maintenance of consciousness and then elevation of the pain threshold, um, cooperation, some degree of an, you know, amnesia, the variation in their vital signs, and then quick and safe return to activities of daily living. So if you're doing, um, you know, like a colonoscopy, they can be consciously sedated with that, All right? Next slide. And airway management. Airway management, you know, obviously it's a process of protecting and ensuring adequate oxygenation and ventilation occur during the operative, you know, um, process, right? So airway compromise can can cause can be caused by many things such as relaxation of the soft tissue. Um, this relaxed effect may create an occlusion, right, of the trachea, uh, which will trigger a laryngeal spasm, right, and causes constriction and which cannot easily expand. So it creates airway, you know, um, ineffective airway um, issues. Um, so what are some of the complications that you may um, want to pay attention to? Like I said. Langer um, spasm, you know, so reflex and prolonged closure of the vocal cords, you know, bronchial intubation. So this occurs when the ET tube is passed, you know, below the carina into one of the main stem bronchial or tracheal and esophageal perforation, right? So they put the tube and then they perforate that or aspiration, you know, the patient regurgitates and stomach content and other secretion goes into the lungs, resulting in pneumonia and, of course, obstruction of the lung. Next slide. So there's four standard positions for surgical procedure. Um, definitely, you should um, know some of these. The supine position, which is the most frequently used um, for patient position and it's the most natural position for the body to rest. And then you have... Um, the Trendelenburg position, okay, the patient is placed in a supine position, you know, so it's a moderation of that. Um, and the OR bed is modified to head down tilt of 40, 35 to 45 degrees, right? And then you have the reverse Trendelenburg position. So I encourage you to go look at these um, on picture. The entire OR bed is tilted so that the patient's head is higher than his or her foot. And then you have the Fowler's position, right? Um, this is where the patient is placed in a supine position, right? Um, and the head is up. And then you have the recumbent or ventral decubitus position. This is the patient is placed face down, right? Resting on his or her abdomen and chest. And then you have the jackknife, you know, position, right? Um, which is a position, it's a modified Modif a modification of the prone position in which the patient is placed in the prone position or on the OR bed and then inverted in a V position. And then you have the lateral position, position primarily used for thoracic, renal, or orthopedic hip procedure, right? So the patient is, patient is placed in a supine position for, for to give them anesthesia and then turn to the 
to the unaffected side, right? When the patient is in supine, the legs are raised and uh, abducted to expose the region. So I want you to go and look at these different positions. And then you have the lithotomy position. It's used for vaginal, obstetric, urologic, rectal procedures. And then you have the high and then the low lithotomy. Um, clearly, you need to think about some of the complications that could occur from these different surgical positions. Next slide. So this slide is just showing you pictures of the different type of positions that we just discussed. All right, next slide. Again, um, you know, more pictures um, to show you the different position, which is good, you know. So, you know, it's already included in the PowerPoint slide, so you can see, um, you know, exams can be pointed and see what position is this. So you need to know your different position. Next slide. So with this slide, we're looking at the high-risk position complication, right? Um, so pre-operative pre assessment of the client, that's why it's really important, right? So if you identify in the beginning those who are at risk, then you can eliminate the risk, right? So the geriatric patient positions may be complicated with that. The pediatric patient may not be able to assume certain position. Those who are extremely thin, those who are extremely obese, paralyzed individuals, diabetic individuals, those who have prosthetic, you know, patient with edema, patient with, you know, DVT problems, blood clot problems. So you got to like look at all these different positions and say, okay, what are some of these positions that can definitely impact the success of my, of this surgery, right? Next slide. So um, high risk situation, again, long surgical procedure, you know, a patient is in surgery for a long time, that is also going to create a problem, right? Vascular surgery, so blood perfusion may be already compromised, right? And now we're doing surgery to those area. Uh, those people that have malignant um, metastasis or osteoporosis, you know, those conditions, you know, the, the surgical procedure, the length, the position may compliment, complicate that. Excessive sustained pressure on the body. So they're laying there for 12 hours of surgery, you know, and if they're already at risk for um, impaired skin integrity, uh, other condition, this is definitely, um, so it's part of our job to make sure that um, we're positioning the patient and monitoring it very closely um, to prevent pressure ulcer and so forth. All right, next slide. Um, so there are different types of um, positioning devices. Um, the choice of a particular positioning device uh, for a surgical procedure depends on many variables. So variables such as how high, how tall the patient is, how much they weigh, you know, the age and any psychological condition and, and position required for the procedure influence what kind to use. Um, and they can use beds, head, head, head rest, on boards, arm restraints, padding for their bony preeminences, Blankets, pillows, safety straps, sandbags, beanbags, towels, sheets, foam pads, gel type. So it's all of these things are being done so that we can make sure that the patient doesn't develop additional complications from that are that are preventable. All right. So that ends the um, this chapter. So this is the patient that we are taking into surgery. So we've done preoperative. Um, and now we say it's intra. So we made sure first that, okay, time and pause. Is this the right patient? Is this the right procedure? Is this the right surgeon? You know, do we, have we looked at any other problems that could put this patient at risk doing surgery? Like, do they have diabetes? Do they have uh, arrhythmias? We've done all of the necessary stuff. And then after that, we make sure that the nurses who are on board, the, the sterile team, the non-sterile team, all scrub and doing the right thing. And then we're putting the patient in the right position and understand which position and what the benefit of a disposition is and making sure that the position that the patient is on, it's not going to create additional complications for this patient, right? So think about all the possible nursing diagnosis when the patient is in surgery, right? At risk for injury, right? Because you're they're in surgery for 12. Injury is a big deal. You know, cardiac arrhythmias, they can have complications depending on what type of surgery that they have. So you identify all those things and you come up with a goal and then intervention on how you're gonna make sure that the problems that you may anticipate, because that's an important nurse, a good nurse is one who anticipate problems that may come, all right? All right, that ends this.